Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 286, looking at the current controversy going on between several high-level Magic the Gathering judges and Wizards of the Coast. I wish with a title like this that I was talking about the new dual deck that I would love to see, Wizards vs. Judges, featuring Snapcaster, Mage, and Grand Arbiter in new promos, but unfortunately... I'm talking about a rather controversial lawsuit that has been brought forward against Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast has responded to this lawsuit with a public statement that is missing pretty much all details. This is the first I had heard of the lawsuit was on April 20th, and I needed to do a lot of digging around to actually find the lawsuit and figure out what was going on. Wizards of the Coast especially for people who are not that familiar with Magic the Gathering, has a judges program. They provide official resources for judges, they certify judges, they have a judge center, and they can basically say who can and cannot be a judge. They also run really large public events or are involved with these public events and that's something that is going to be at the heart of this lawsuit is these giant grand prix events these competitive level events where wizards has a presence there there's another company who is running those events and wizards has control over who can judge at these giant grand prix events the other thing to keep in mind is that this lawsuit is really scoped to look at competitive and professional level events. Plaintiffs in this case were careful not to have this lawsuit extend to casual events like Friday Night Magic. This is only for giant events like the Pro Tour or Pro Tour qualifiers, although competitive events can actually be rather small. And where that line is, is a very important one, especially given that this is a class action lawsuit, which means that the individuals who brought forward the complaint are saying that they represent a large number of people, so many that they really can't determine who all of them are that have been wronged in this same way that the plaintiffs are. So who is suing? We've got Adam Shaw, Peter Golightly, Justin Turner, Joshua Stanfeld. There's a little bit inside the actual complaint about uh, who these individuals are, and I did a little bit of research on top of that. I have a link down in the About section to the complaint. You should definitely read through the complaint and see it. But two of the more notable people in this lawsuit are Adam Shaw, who's been a longtime Magic player and a judge, and Justin Turner, who has not only been a high-level judge, but a regional coordinator, and a regional coordinator that was involved with the leak scandal that happened a few months ago, where Wizards decided to ban a bunch of individuals who are members of a Facebook group where some leaked cards appeared. Uh, it was this very shotgun-style approach to dealing with leaks. And I think that may be part of the catalyst behind this lawsuit, because if you're a regional coordinator and you're putting on GP style events, having your ability to judge the game revoked basically means that you were fired at that point. You're thrown out of your ability to get compensation for something that you're being paid for at those high level events. Why did this lawsuit come about? As I've already mentioned, I think the suspensions may have had something to do with it, but additionally, there are a series of other claims in this lawsuit that should be taken rather seriously, and I'm sure Wizards is taking them seriously right now. The claims are that uh, judges at these high-level events are not being compensated at a minimum wage. Uh, many of them are being paid, but may be paid on a contractual basis that when you look at the number of hours that they're working is below a minimum wage, um, that that could translate in some cases into wage theft, uh, that they are not getting meal breaks and they're not being compensated for out-of-pocket expenses. The relief that the plaintiffs are looking for here fall into three categories, cash, an injunction, and that the DCI become a 501c3. I'm gonna look at these each a little more in depth. The monetary side, is for lost wages, claims to 
get those judges up to a minimum wage standard with wage statements, with holdings, that type of stuff when they are participating in those pro and competitive level events. And attorney's fees may be available in this case. Now an injunction is basically an order by the court asking Wizards, or actually telling Wizards of the Coast not to continue with these practices. So don't continue to do it anymore. Beyond that though, the most interesting claim here is to move the DCI or the Judges Association out of the direct control of Wizards of the Coast and into a 501c3 organization, into a nonprofit organization. And this is the most interesting claim to me. A lot of people think that 501c3s or charitable organizations are just humanitarian organizations, but there's a lot of different types of 501c3s out there. TED, which puts on the best talks out there, technology, entertainment, design, charges giant amounts of money to show up to the convention as a 501c3. PetSmart has an entire arm that's a 501c3. Uh, the ABA, the American Bar Association, is a 501c3. Most educational institutions are 501c3s. And the one that actually kind of bothers me occasionally is the NCAA, giant multi-million dollar corporation that has licensing, rights, deals with video game companies all the time, they're a 501c3. So the tax exempt status under 501c3 is actually much broader than most people realize. And why does this matter? It comes into play because there are two different defenses that wizards can really put forward. One of them is the, it wasn't me, I swear defense. And that defense is, other people were running these events. Other people were in charge of paying the employees who were there. It was our partners. We work with them. They had oversight at the time. They had control. We work with them, Wasn't me. but we are not the ones directly in charge here. And this brings up a really interesting recent ruling from the National Labor Relations Board that looks at this idea of joint employers. And this decision really allows a second entity to be also considered an employer for these type of claims. And this hinges around whether an employer has exercised control over terms and conditions of employment indirectly through an intermediary or whether it has reserved the authority to do so. And the ability to license who judges are and fire judges at any point in time without notice and without cause worldwide seems that they have some control over a regional coordinator's ability to get paid to put on these events and do these events. Beyond that, Wizards does have a presence at these events. They have licensing agreements over what can and can't be used. Sometimes they have an entire coverage team there and they have standards that they want these events to be run at. Where the line is between these companies that are putting on the events acting solely as independent entities or as agents or even partners of Wizards of the Coast is a very difficult line to determine given how integrated Wizards of the Coast is with the Pro Tour events. The other major argument that could be put forward is, hey, these guys are volunteers. They're just here on their own time. They're not expecting compensation, although at that higher level, many judges are paid for their participation in these events and often paid below a minimum wage. Uh, but beyond that, there's a bigger challenge to this volunteer argument that has come about in the last few years, and that's that volunteers are not allowed for for-profit corporations. If you've got individuals that are doing work for you on a regular basis, you can't have unpaid interns as a for-profit. You must be a public agency for civic, charitable, or humanitarian reasons in order to be able to qualify to have these type of volunteers. Which gets us back to the 501c3 question. There's a clear legal strategy here that they're looking at these intern decisions that have come out against major companies saying that you have to actually pay your interns if you are a for-profit, and they're trying to extend this to the gaming realm. 
this is a novel approach. I have not seen any opinions that have even dealt with this topic. The court really has two different options here. They can extend that precedent that looks at interns in the for-profit space and apply it to judges in these major magic competitive events, or they could look at some other way to try to formulate this opinion and try to argue that the these weekend events that are hobby-based are different than what you might get out of an internship where you are showing up, you're at the place of employment, that type of thing. I think there's actually a pretty strong argument here that those higher level judges at competitive events that flow into the pro tour, specifically the flagship marketing event for Wizards of the Coast are clearly not volunteers or at least not allowed to be volunteers under the current state of employment law. What do I think the outcome is this of this is going to be? Now, this is a class action lawsuit. So if the class is really fully certified and there is a settlement, anybody else who could be a member of that class could actually get something out of that settlement. So this may be a little bit different. There may be a settlement that allows a lot of different judges nationally that have a claim and may be able to get some small amount of wages from this lawsuit. Wizards could decide to take this all the way through to a jury trial. I don't think that would be in Wizards' interest. I, I think an agreement to spin the DCI off is a separate entity and then stack the board of directors to that entity with individuals who are committed to making Magic one of the best esports out there would be very, very good. There can be cooperation between a corporation and a 501c3. There can be funding that moves from that corporation to that 501c3. I also think that having a little more of a charitable focus on the DCI would be a good thing. Gaming overall has the power to enable and empower individuals in many different ways. And the DCI could be doing more on the community outreach aspect portion that frankly becoming a 501c3 would make them more aware of than just running these high level competitive events that feed into the pro tour. We've got a kind of myopic view of magic that has recently been changing to include more casual play and it would be nice to see it include community outreach and service as part of that future direction for magic. So I have high hopes that this lawsuit brings about a change in the way that Wizards of the Coast views those events, and it takes an opportunity to really look at this huge group of people who are actually volunteering huge amounts of time unpaid to a corporation and figures out a way to use them in a more charitable way that could give back to our community more broadly. For another perspective on this lawsuit, I definitely recommend checking out um, Jeremy Bylan's article, which I will have a link to in the about section. Uh, he does not really have a background in magic, but talks about these employment law issues in plain English really, really well. A little bit unhappy that it is on a site where you've got to have an account to click on any of the links or see the lawsuits. So I've got the pleading also posted down there in a Google Doc. Additionally, I just wanted to say a personal thank you um, to Gregory Hitzel, an employment lawyer here in Washington State that consulted with me a lot over this video. I am an intellectual property, copyright, trademark lawyer. This is not my area of practice. I spent a lot of time reading and looking at precedences and smart intellectual people can definitely disagree on how this case is going to turn out and what the claims and responses will actually be by the end of the day. And Gregory was willing to walk through that stuff with me. I greatly appreciate it. He's also got four more cases here that are related issues for those of you who just love reading opinions and want to dive into the most recent case law that could really be brought up in this case with Wizard's response. 
I will be updating you guys on this case as it moves forward uh, for the latest in Magic the Gathering news and some occasional weighing of the scales of justice when law intersects with magic subscribe to the channel thank you to everybody who's out there supporting the channel on patreon i've got pack openings coming up on 518 i have some big announcements coming for the channel also in the next few days we just hit 12,000 subscribers today i'm so happy thank you guys so much i look forward to the next 12,000 and actually hitting that 2 million views mark here in the next few months take care and until next time, choose the cards wisely.